Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the State Performance Plan Technical Assistance Project uh, webinar, The Ongoing Journey of Racial Equity Work, a District Story by Dr. Amar Sahili with San Lorenzo Unified School District. Uh, our speakers at this time are muted, uh, so we don't have any background noise. Um, you can also mute your own phones if you would like at this time. Uh, we will go ahead and get started. It is noon. Uh, my name is Jennifer D. Shazer uh, with the State Performance Plan Technical Assistance Project, TA Systems Coordinator. And I want to take a quick moment before we get started to kind of go over some of the services SPP TAP provides for those of you who are not familiar with us. Uh, we uh, provide webinars such as today uh, to any district uh, who is interested in addressing disproportionality. Uh, we also provide community of practice meetings for districts, invited districts, uh, who are dealing with uh, significant disproportionality. Uh, we also have the sppTAP.org website, which has a plethora of resources available for anyone interested in addressing disproportionality. And then we also offer ongoing assistance to districts. Uh, you can contact Connie or myself uh, at the email addresses below if you have any questions. And then I'll take a moment right now. As you know, we have already said that the phone lines are muted. Uh, to be able to participate today, the best way to do that is we, uh, if you notice on the right-hand side of your screen, there's a chat that is available to everyone. Uh, that will be where you can answer any questions as Dr. Amar uh, raises them or any questions to the group. Um, those are available for everyone. There is also a private comments and questions box just below that. Uh, those are only available uh, to the SPP TAP staff and to uh, Dr. Amar Sahili as well. Uh, and then there will also be polls as we go along as well that you'll be able to add some input. So let's go ahead and get this started. We have a lot of information to cover today. Uh, we will be, uh, the webinar is The Ongoing Journey of the Racial Equity Work, a District Story for Application. Uh, Dr. Amar Sahili will be presenting today. He is the Director of Student Support Services at San Lorenzo Unified School District and is also the CEO of Sahili 7 Educational. He is in his ninth year with San Lorenzo and is going to share with us today the ongoing uh, racial equity work that is happening there. So if you'd like, Dr. Amar, if you'd like to go ahead and turn on your camera and we can unmute you, uh, you can go ahead and start. Give us just a second, Dr. Amar. Okay, it sounds like at this point we still can't hear you, Dr. Omar. Is your uh, phone line muted on your actual phone by chance? I'll press star star as well and see if that. How about now? Perfect. Yep. Yay. Thank you so much. Okay. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks. All right, great. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so I am uh, privileged and pleased to be able to participate in this uh, webinar today. And as Jen already uh, indicated, the topic that we're working with is the ongoing journey of racial equity work, uh, a district story for application. So as, as we get started, I do just want to share up front that within this presentation, we're not going to get uh, very deep into equity conceptions connected to race, but we're really going to spend uh, the majority of the time talking about how, as a school district, we have been able to maintain this work over uh, what is now our ninth school year. So it's really more of a conversation about how we've been able to sustain the work knowing that the, the conceptions of, of racialized equity work are, are often very difficult uh, and, and oftentimes it's something that 
uh, can be shut down if things don't don't go uh, according to the plan, whoever's plan that might be. So we're going to just really try to emphasize uh, our sustainability work uh, around this and not get as deep into the the actual hows of, of us going about this this work. We'll start just with the opening quote from a, a fascinating uh, researcher and an attorney and professor, uh, Dr. Eric Yamamoto, who does a lot of work uh, deeply connected to critical race, race theory. And he says, as observed by Frederick Douglass, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor racial justice and yet deprecate agitation want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. Eric Yamamoto adds that struggle, that agitation to heal racial wounds, means facing ourselves and, and one another. So again, it's just helping us understand up front that the work is difficult and to assume that we can uh, produce outcomes that, that are racially just and socially just without the struggle uh, is something that, that really is not, is not possible. So I'd just like to, to start with that. So also just some, some background information about uh, how this invitation was even presented to me to uh, share this information with you today. So we all know that our, our July was quite interesting in terms of, as well as traumatic, in terms of the number of uh, African-American men who were, were shot by police. These were unarmed African-American men, as you see to the right of your, your screen there. Uh, and then we, we also had uh, police officers ambushed and, and shot. So we start off with Black Lives Matter, uh, then comes into play the conversation regard blue, regarding Blue Lives Matter, All Lives Matter. Uh, and so then we find many people at the table having a conversation, which really helps us understand that no one can afford to be silent uh, in the face of injustice. We have uh, Kareem Gaines there. We had all of the stuff. Uh, going on from a contentious nature based upon our election that all of us are well aware now uh, concluded last night with, with Donald Trump uh, being president, now the president of the United States. And so there's just a lot that was there. And so as we uh, engage in those conversations uh, in relationship to what happened and what was happening over, over the summer, uh, our, our district superintendent, Dr. Fred Brill, reached out to me and asked if I would be willing to uh, develop or create a website to help the adults in our district, the students in our district, uh, and the, the, the teachers in our district, help them have uh, and come in contact with support systems to be able to have some of these deep uh, and necessary conversations in the classroom, knowing that students could potentially uh, be coming back into the classroom from, from the summer break, having experienced and witnessed a lot of uh, different forms of tragedy via social media, via the television. Uh, and so we wanted to put some things together to be of support uh, to those teachers. So this particular screenshot here is really just uh, an actual picture of the web page that was uh, created by way of the motivating factors of, of the superintendent. So after uh, that website was, was created. I then shared it with a few people, uh, including SPP TAP, and then based upon uh, me sharing that information, uh, conversations continued, and then I was asked if I would be willing uh, to just share some of the work that we do uh, here in San Lorenzo Unified based upon equity and especially under uh, a racial or racialized equity lens. And I will say that, again, this is this is year number nine, and we know the year has, has just started, but this is year number nine of our uh, intentional and explicit equity work in this district. In no form or fashion am I saying that, that it means that our, our work is perfect, that our data is perfect, and all of our outcomes are meeting the necessary targets. But what I can say is perhaps creating uh, this particular website that led to some of these conversations to have created such a website probably in year one of the work probably would not have been possible. Perhaps it would have been considered too radical or, or too off-putting, but after nine years of, of 
you know, uh, engaging in these conversations and, and putting forward some actions, it now made it uh, a possibility for us to take some of the, the more deeper steps uh, along the way. So Brene Brown is, is another uh, uh, lady that I'm, that I'm a fan of in terms of some of her scholarship and her work, especially in relationship to personal development, and equity, and things of that nature. And she says that you can't get to courage without walking through vulnerability. So we know that this work is, it's, uh, it comes with some trepidation. It comes with some, some anxiety-provoking uh, modalities. And what, what Brene Brown says is that we really can't engage in anything that, that we would consider or call courageous if we, first of all, don't come to the table with the spirit of vulnerability. So if we're not going to be vulnerable in our conversations and, and in our actions, then we really can't call them courageous. So uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm encouraging everyone on this call uh, to connect themselves with on, on deeper and deeper levels, especially as we're moving uh, into the realms of, of our country here in America as we've just started last night, is we want to make sure that we're, we're being vulnerable, that as we're having these conversations that we know they're risky, uh, they're painful, they cause anxiety, but for the sake of our students and the families that we serve, we really want to take that next step and break silence, uh, become vulnerable, and have, have some of those necessary uh, conversations. So we're going to move forward with a, a quick poll here. So your first, your first inquiry of, of this webinar that you'll be able to respond to in an interactive uh, format is, does your district or school or program, because perhaps everyone uh, on this webinar is not necessarily from a school, but you may be from a particular agency or some other kind of institution, uh, does your district or school have consistently functioning equity teams? So in other words, does your school, does your district, does your agency uh, have built-in mechanisms where uh, there are teams that, that look at things within your organization from, a, from an equitable, from a racialized perspective, uh, using a socially just lens as well. So just take some time and, and respond. I see people are responding now uh, to those questions, but we really just want to give you time to uh, address, address that question. I see numbers are coming in. Looks like we have about, it's almost split, not, not exactly. Uh, getting closer to an exact split. So based on what I can see, we have about 40, well, it's shifting. I'll, I'll wait. I don't want to rush anyone. All right, so it looks like coming in, we're at about almost 60% with a no and a little less than 41% or 59% with a no, around 40% with a yes. So again, that's just another, another point of encouragement that within your uh, agencies and school institutions, uh, even from a district-wide perspective, that that you start developing some type of of equity team that's connected to your site. Sometimes it's called a culture and, and climate team, but really one of the keys is to make sure the work also not just focuses on uh, traditional subgroups like 
uh, EL or, or, or special ed or, or socioeconomically disadvantaged, but that you're also pulling out things related to uh, race. So you want to make sure you're, you're also focusing in on those racial um, subgroups as well. So we're going to move forward, but we do have 62.5% with a no, 37.5% uh, uh, with, a, with a yes. So we'll, we'll move forward here. So here's your second, second question. Inquiry number two, it's kind of, it's a two-parter. Uh, what is the biggest barrier to establishing equity teams and facilitating conversations that keep race and racial disproportionality central? So again, I'm going to give you some time to uh, respond to these questions a bit more in-depthly as you type out your, your answers. But what is the biggest barrier to establishing equity teams and facilitating conversations that keep race and racial disproportionality central. reading some of the comments that are being typed as well. start responding to some of these in around about 15 more seconds. So as I, I see some have uh, typed, some, some of the more classic ones that we uh, consistently receive is around uh, time. So I see that's an issue that some people are, are willing and ready to have the conversations but not really feeling that they necessarily have, have the time uh, to actually uh, engage. Some have shared that it's also an issue of, of capacity. Another another classic uh, comment that kind of gets in the way as a barrier uh, is also competing priorities. So again, I think one of one of the reasons uh, why I was asked to be able to share this particular information through this webinar is the fact that we have been able to uh, keep it consistent despite competing priorities, despite the time. Uh, conceptions and all of that in San Lorenzo Unified, we have been able to uh, keep this work uh, protected, keep it a bit sacred and guarded from from other things that might might come in, including uh, different emotions that that people might have. So that's some of the stuff we'll be able to talk about here today is just our systematic approach of getting us from where we started to where we are now and how we're still striving, striving to push this, work, uh, push this work forward. I also see the stated finding the right person to uh, necessary, necessarily take the lead uh, in this work. That's also uh, a big one. And, and the work, as we just talked about in terms of Brene, Brene Brown and, and some of her work, uh, the critical importance of, of making sure that as we're engaging in this work, that we're also willing to be vulnerable uh, with this work 
uh, also. So we're going to uh, move forward. I do appreciate uh, all of those comments. Let me check to see if there's another another theme I should pull out here. Uh, again, there's too many time and too many competing uh, initiatives or or priorities. Mental models. We're going to talk about some mental models uh, today as well, and you see that perhaps in your packet already. All right, so just to share with you now some district demographics uh, based upon San Lorenzo Unified. We are not a large um, district, but I wouldn't want someone to walk away and say, oh, well, they're able to accomplish that uh, because they're a, a smaller district. I believe this, this work can be accomplished regardless of of size, and there might actually even be advantage, advantages uh, to this work for for larger larger districts. But uh, San Lorenzo Unified, uh, this is just a, a racial uh, breakdown of our district, as well as free and reduced lunch, and uh, just from a, a non-cumulative perspective. So again, you see it there: African American students, 11.6%. Of our district, Asian students 13.1, Filipino 7.6, uh, Hispanic 56.1, uh, white 9.1 percent, and other 2.5. Uh, ironically, just from a racial perspective, I had someone uh, in my office a couple of years ago. They walked in and said, uh, "Dr. Sahili, I want you to place my 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 child in one of your all white schools." Well, when you look at our our data. Clearly, we don't have any all-white schools. Uh, over half of our district is, is Latino, Latina. Uh, you see our free and reduced lunch, 62.2%, uh, and our district is around 11,000 11, students. So just to give you an overview of who we are from a, a, a racial demographic perspective as well. Um, looking at some of our... Discipline data by way of suspensions uh, over time. When I came into San Lorenzo Unified, it was during the 08-09 school year. So the year before I arrived, we had over 3,000 uh, suspensions. And, and just to put things in context, as I became the director of student support services, no one, no one said to me, that we had a suspension problem per se. Uh, but looking at that 07, 08 data, it was quite alarming. And just in contrast, as we look at some other data uh, a bit later in this, in this particular conversation or talk, um, one of our elementary schools alone had 331 uh, suspensions. So again, that, that meant that we deeply had to, to do some work. And you see that our, our numbers, for the most part, uh, have gone down. Uh, over time, and that's, that's you know, I, I think most schools and school districts across California and even across the nation at this particular point, uh, data should be going down. So it's not really something to where we can celebrate because suspension numbers are going down. Uh, we also need to make sure that we are, are closing gaps racially and that we're staying on, uh, on top of, of disproportionality as well. So it's not just about the, the overall suspension aggregate, but you also want to make sure in your district uh, that you're looking at suspension rates and then that you're comparing those within your, your district and that you're also apparent, comparing those across your, your county lines and throughout, throughout the state. So we try to do that as well. So also just moving forward, a, a look at some of our uh, expulsion and expulsion referral data. For me, it's, it's not enough just to track data um, by way of overall expulsions, but for me, it's important for us in our district to track data based upon the number of students that were just even recommended or referred uh, for expulsion because we know that that's when the, not just the clock starts ticking, but investigations start and teachers have to write a narrative and, and people have to come in for meetings. So, for me, it's important to also not just track the amount of students that were actually expelled, but uh, the amount that were referred for rec that were recommended for expulsion as well. So you see, 0809 school year, I was deeply alarmed with a, a district as small as ours. We had 101 students recommended for expulsion. That meant there was one, more than one student every other day um, being recommended for expulsion. So the, again, that that was a genesis for us to 
really uh, turn the heat up and engage in some more equity-driven uh, conversations. So you see that our data it has uh, gotten better over time. And last year was actually the first year that I've been in the school district where no student was actually expelled out of the district. We did have some students on suspended expulsion, um, but no student was actually expelled out of out of uh, the district. So another another thing is in in our district that, that's very important is we share our uh, discipline data by race across all schools. Um, so that's something that's also very important has and has contributed to uh, some of our success with with uh, our our discipline data decline. We still have a long way to go, but we have. Uh, arrived at a point culturally where now each month I'm able to share uh, suspension data and even expulsion data. We've had one expulsion referral um, this year that didn't go anywhere, but I'm able to share data on a monthly basis across all of the schools. So each month every school is able to see what each school is doing from a suspension or even an expulsion uh, perspective, and we even do similar things from a chronic absenteeism uh, perspective as perspective as well. My light's going to go off in this office. I uh, forgot about that piece. All right, so let's get to another another inquiry. Inquiry number three, give you another opportunity to respond. Is racially disaggregated data shared across your district? I have presented in districts, and upon leaving, uh, found out that some of the uh, principals or assistant principals were offended that they received their data from their district for the professional development in a racially disaggregated format. So question is, are you sharing across the board with your uh, district or even within your school racially disaggregated data? Is it being shared across the board? And I'll give you time to respond to that. See the, the numbers shifting and turning as we speak puts me in mind of watching CNN last night. This is good news thus far. You can keep the keep the poll going. As of now. 73% says yes, and only 26% says no. And I guess, and I'm, I'm not asking a different question now, but I guess another question, and it, it could be part of your response as well, is, is this data shared in a way to where all schools get to see everyone's data? Or is it that just one school site is able to receive their racially disaggregated data? So we're up to 78, almost 79%, 78.9% with a yes, and 21% with a no. So that's, that's, that's good. It's, it's very important to share that data, uh, I, I saw a pretty significant shift in our district just from a, a culture perspective and even a camaraderie perspective as we were able to start sharing that data uh, collectively. Some people, and, and, it, and it's not for us in San Lorenzo Unified, we're not sharing the data because it's a competition. Um, we're sharing the data because we want to make sure we're operating like a like a family. So we're going to move forward from this particular poll, but again, leaving it, it's a exact 80% says yes and a 20% says no. So again, San Lorenzo Unified, our, our structure for how we go about having our 
uh, racialized equity conversations that are then designed to produce action across the district. So our uh, racial equity convening structure uh, started in 2008, 2009, and going through uh, the 2015-2016 the school year last year, our team, our, our uh, racialized equity team or, or racialized equity leadership team consisted of about 50 people, 50 attendees, uh, superintendent, director, coordinators, principals, assistant principals, and some psychologists. And then at the end of last year, we engaged in conversations about adding uh, the classified side to these conversations as well. So just keep in mind that meant from 08, uh, from the 08 09 school year to the 15 16 school year, eight years, it only consisted of those, those that first group superintendent, director. So that would be director of um, secondary education, director of elementary education, director of special education, director of uh, English language development and, and assessment, director of student support services director of technology, uh, and then the principals, APs, and, and some psychologists. So for eight years, this was the group, and we just added uh, another group that, that caused this number to jump from 50 to 80. All right, so now it includes all uh, certificated and classified leaders and managers, and so we come together monthly uh, to have our racialized equity conversations uh, across across our district. So we'll say a bit more about that. This is actually our first, I believe this is our first meeting of the year, uh, September the 15th. So we will say more about the fact that we are meeting uh, in a circle format. And so we'll talk about Ms. Amani Dunham and the work that she's doing with our district under the conceptions of restorative practices and restorative justice um, as well. But this is just giving you a picture of what it looks like. So again, we meet every third Thursday from 345 to 515 to have these racially intense uh, conversations. And again, we've been able to sustain this over uh, the past eight school years, and now we're in our, our ninth uh, school year. So just to give you some more information about the genesis uh, of the work and just the conceptions around confrontation, uh, so here's one of our very first uh, slides. Uh, it was entitled Empowerment, Capacity, and Confrontation, K-Adult Management Meeting. It's what we called it at that time. Uh, I was one of the last three months to actually make it through this particular slide from a perspective and from a place of actually owning the work. So we simply put the question out there, how comfortable are you in admitting, owning, and speaking to the reality that in public education, racism exists, institutional racism exists, white privilege exists, uh, and statistically black and brown students are underperforming? It took us three months to deal with this particular slide, but once we finally got to that point, we sat in silence for uh, a, a, a period of time and said, you know, we're not going to move away from this slide. And the first person that spoke in terms of owning this actually broke out in tears. Uh, it was our current uh, uh, assistant superintendent of, of educational services, uh, Barb DeBarger. And that, her, her willingness to become vulnerable in that moment really pushed our work forward because it told many of the other people that were part of the team that it is okay to be uh, uh, courageous and to be vulnerable uh, in this work. So just to look at some beginning uh, prompts of our work, this is just an example of some of the work in terms of how we started. This was just one of our exercise exercises, so just getting out of your comfort zone, describe to a partner your most recent brave conversation with a teacher, colleague, or family member regarding race and equity, and include in your dialogue what was difficult about the conversation. So again, this is a 0809 this is how we started started the work, and the expectation was also that our principals that would be participating in this work and our assistant principals, we would be modeling in these monthly sessions what principals can also take back and have similar uh, conversations with their faculty and staff. Here was a writing prompt, describe a memorable encounter with 
with personally witnessing or experiencing racial inequality in public education, be prepared um, to share out. Now, there, there were times where I would get emails from various participants who would say, Amar, please do not call on me. So again, even though we've been doing this work for now nine years, in the beginning there were people who really felt like they could not speak and they would send me a private message asking me uh, uh, to not call on them. And we just kind of worked our way through through that process. So just want to uh, speed up a bit here and, and walk you through just our first three years at a glance so you can see just from a chemistry perspective and a climate perspective and even a sequential perspective uh, how, how we approached our, our work. So just uh, year one, some highlights, 0809. Our theme was understanding the students that we serve. Uh, we started with a, a district retreat uh, regarding understanding urban students. Uh, here's actually one of our slides, so it was actually entitled uh, Working with and Understanding the Dynamics of Black and Brown Urban and Inner City Students, a Bay Area Perspective. Uh, so this was one of our very first presentations. Uh, and then again, just in relationship to our theme, we also uh, collectively developed an equity mission statement. And we'll share that a bit later, and you probably have it in your packet as well. Uh, in addition to the whole group coming together to create a district-wide equity mission statement, we also engaged in some equity uh, uh, classroom or, or district or, or school uh, observations. So we developed a team called PILOT. Uh, I can't even remember holistically what, what PILOT stands for. I think it might be uh, Principal Intervention Leadership Observation Team, something uh, like that, but this was our, our district level equity team. So we would actually go into the schools and we would be looking for things related to some of the equity norms that, that we had developed. Also under year one, uh, we introduced uh, student intervention services teams at all sites. So we tried to go from an RTI square perspective and create academic teams as well as behavior teams. And the behavior teams were responsible for looking at some of those equity interventions that could be implemented. Uh, we don't have all of those in place now. What we have in place at many of our sites, again, with some of the work of Ms. Amani Dunham and our social workers, our culture and climate um, teams. But through SPED, we do still have a pretty uh, robust RTI squared model. Also, we engaged in some individual principal equity meetings. So in year one, I met with every single principal just to check in with them about needs that they had, anxieties that they had, fears that they had about engaging this work, but they had some one-on-one some -on -one attention about how they felt about some of the equity work and what they needed to feel successful to move to move forward with it. Moving into year two, 0910, again, like I said, this is not a conversation that, that's, that's deeply connected to what we actually talk about and how we actually talk about it. It's really just giving you a, a bird's eye view of how we systematically uh, walked into this particular work in San Lorenzo Unified. So year two, uh, our very first meeting, once all of the principals, the system principals got back and the director, superintendent, uh, our very first August district was retreat uh, and additional trainings, they were facilitated uh, by this very first one by Dr. Shiraki Holly as well as uh, R.T. Fisher, not sure if you're aware of that particular organization, uh, but we, we have a partner with R.T. Fisher, and we brought R.T. Fisher in specifically to help us gain more equity-minded approaches around math. We saw that there were some pretty uh, deep gaps going on within our district and with our students around math, also with some emphasis on our African-American students, and so they helped us up front with some of our year two professional development around equity for this particular team. Also, uh, there was the introdu introduction of the district wide that we developed, and then we also provided the year two 13 culturally relevant strategies and research provided by myself uh, to each person in, in the school district as well. We also developed some fishbowl exercises and another exercise that, that came uh, to us. I, I stole this from some of the work that we were doing when I was in San Leandro uh, Unified, but we developed the I Am From poem just to build deeper levels of, of culture and camaraderie across our uh, racialized equity leadership team uh, designed to build trust and, again, relationship and, and community. 
Also, there was the implementation in our district of equity interview questions. So this was, was by, de by design, so to kind of mitigate or at least help to mitigate people coming into the district asking questions such as, you know, why are you guys talking about race? Why are you discussing race? Well, we could then fall back to the reality of in this district, even in your interview, there were uh, interview questions connected to race. So, so we're, we're not afraid to talk about race. It may not be comfortable, but it is something that we're striving to normalize uh, in the district so much so that we even have uh, racialized questions and equity questions in the interview. Moving to year three, uh, the theme for year three was cultural competence, personal reflection, privilege, and white privilege. So again, we, we knew, and I was very aware, that year three, introducing the concept of white privilege and whiteness is where things could go wrong. Like typically when you get to the place of talking about white privilege and whiteness, that's when someone, I call them professional saboteurs, that's when someone, someone figures out who to scream to the loudest to shut the work down. Um, so we were quite strategic in, in how we presented this information and who presented the information as well. And it was also important for me to couple the conceptions of white privilege with privilege also, so that it wasn't just from a, a white or whiteness perspective, but that we also help people understand through some of the work of Stephanie Graham that for those working in education, we also, we also have a certain level of privilege as well. May not be white privilege, but we just wanted to have that power dynamic conversation. So we started year three with our district retreat uh, with, with Stephanie Graham doing day one because she does some awesome work, and I think you have some information in your packet about her and uh, one of the books that, that she was responsible for authoring with a bunch of other um, scholars as well. Uh, so we had Dr. Stephanie Graham do the, the privilege and white privilege piece, and she does a lot of uh, exemplary work around targets and agents of the work and subjects of the work. Um, so she did day one, and then we brought in Dr. Edwin Javis to do day two, and then he ended up doing uh, some systemic work w with us throughout year three. Uh, also, one of the strategic things that we did in terms of trying to introduce conceptions of whiteness in a non-threatening way so that we wouldn't have people walking away from the table or saying that the work is too, uh, is too uncomfortable to continue to move forward, we also viewed uh, a video uh, that I recommend to all of you called Mirrors of Privilege, Making Whiteness Visible. Mirrors of Privilege, Making Whiteness Visible. Um, everyone in the DVD is white, and they share their, their personal stories, personal journeys about how they had to struggle through whiteness and, and, and move into becoming anti-racist leaders uh, in their own regard and in their own, own right. Also in year three, uh, there was the sharing of, similar to the, the um, I Am From poem we moved into, and this was something brought to us by our Director of Special Services, uh, Mr. Ed Diolazzo, uh, the equity epiphany narrative. And so in this regard, each, each person on the team, all 50, were responsible for writing uh, an essay in relationship to their first encounter with race and racism. And we use that as just another, another vehicle to help us get uh, more connected to, to each other. And I'll, I'll just share a very, a very brief story in sharing my equity epiphany with one of my faculties in my, my DICE program, which is an independent study program that has about nine uh, instructors connected to it. And again, this was, this was year three of our work, but I remember reading my equity epiphany to this faculty group in one of our faculty meetings, and one of my white colleagues at the end said, oh, now I understand that this work is not about blaming white people. So on one hand, I was happy. On the other hand, I was sad. I was happy for the fact that my colleague now knew that this work was not about blaming white people. I was sad because for three years, that was the mode she was operating under and how uncomfortable that is to think that the work of equity or being an anti-racist uh, leader is about blaming, 
blaming white people. So it's also important in this work to neutralize to neutralize blame as, as much as possible because blame is, is the kryptonite to racialized equity work. So also we, we share the equity epiphany narrative that at each meeting we had about two people share. Uh, and then we also had the monthly K adult trainings by Dr. Uh, Edwin Javis regard, regarding culturally relevant and accountable instruction and principal leadership capacity or, or competency. We also did the monthly sharing of suspension data. So as the director of student support services, it took me three years to feel even comfortable sharing our data across across all school all school systems. So we did not start that way. Um, and then we also had a voluntary um, equity session around trauma. And I brought in Dr. Ricardo Carrillo, uh, and this was an after-school thing, and we just opened it up for any teachers that were uh, willing to, to participate. So here you just see some of our growth areas. And again, this is from year three. Some of these growth areas are still relevant for us today. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that we continue to find is having principals take back the bold and courageous conversations to generate actions um, at their at their school site. So those are things that we are we are still working on. So again, also in San Lorenzo Unified, we have something called the the Equity Initiatives Wheel, and you see to the right of the wheel our equity mission statement that we developed as a team. You can see how old it is because somewhere in there. Um, it doesn't use the terminology of, of underserved. It may even have the terminology of underperformance. And we know today it's about uh, students being underserved as opposed to students under, uh, uh, it's, it's about students uh, being underserved as opposed to students underperforming. So we want to own that. But we also say that you know we have five elements in our equity work, and it's important for all five of these to be in motion um, at the same time. So closing the academic achievement gap, improving campus climate, raising student consciousness, which is critical and one of the most, in, most difficult things to do, but one of the most important also from our own schematic paradigm, uh, raising adult developed cultural awareness of, of self and the students that we serve, and then also deep and meaningful parental uh, involvement. All of those are uh, applicable for us to be able to claim uh, that the work of equity is actually happening. And then a question, a question that has to be asked as well, as we'll get to momentarily, is, is your, is your equity lens, is your equity advocacy, is your advocacy for racially underserved students is it implied or is it explicit? All right, so let's go to this next question. We'll give you a brief, some brief time for that. Uh, inquiry number four, in assessing your equity lens and work, would you rate it as implied or explicit? So implied would mean it's kind of tucked away. You really can't, can't see it. Uh, explicit means no, people are aware that you are a, a equity leader, that you are you are, are a socially just leader uh, striving to be a, a firm participant in anti-racist anti -racist work. Being an explicit equity leader does not mean that you're like a, a, a bull in a china shop, and it doesn't mean that you are not wise. Explicit equity leaders have to be strategic, and they have to be wise in their work. So I wouldn't want someone to take explicit to meaning also unwise or out of balance or or radical to the point of, of detriment and turning people off from the work. So I see some of the, the numbers coming in uh, and it looks looks good. I, I, I like the percentage of explicit over over implied. So that's always something that we're striving uh, to do is to make our work explicit because, again, the, the stakes are uh, extremely high. We'll give you just a few more uh, moments for this. As we see some numbers are still coming into our poll. Hopefully I'm not talking at a pace that's too rapid, but I, I do see that time is, 
is of the essence, and I want to make sure we get through a lot more of our uh, information here uh, as well. Thank you so much. Okay, so again, we have 80% explicit, 20% implied. So again, thank you for responding, responding to that particular poll and interactive question. All right, so I saw someone bring up um, a mental model. And so one of the things that we did do in, in year one is we, we did, we introduced some mental model work around framing. And for me, uh, Dr. Singe, Dr. Peter Singe has some non-threatening uh, mental models and frames just for how to conceptualize uh, the work. And I'm just sharing some of those with you. I actually got these out of one of mine when I was uh, teaching a educational leadership class for uh, Argosy University. Uh, to some doctoral students, and in our in the reader that was assigned for the text, the Jossie Bass reader, uh, Dr. Singe had a very fascinating chapter in the book, and that's where I pulled these mental models out, and we used them uh, in our district. And I even used them on a very introductory level uh, in some of the trainings that I do uh, across the state or wherever. But he says mental models are deeply ingrained assumptions, generalizations, or even pictures or images that influence how we understand the world and how we take action. Also, the discipline of working with mental models starts with turning the mirror inward. So now we're starting to pull out some deeper elements here because it's not just about looking outward and placing blame on, on the exterior, but it's about trying to own some stuff as well. Learning to unearth our internal pictures of the world, to bring them to the surface and hold them rigorously to scrutiny. Uh, it also includes the ability to carry on learningful conversations that balance inquiry and advocacy where people expose their own thinking effectively and make that thinking open to the influence of others. So there we could insert uh, Brene Brown again about the vulnerability that it takes uh, to even be willing to expose your thinking uh, in, in this process. He also says it has been said that a fish would be the last creature on earth to discover water, so totally and continually immersed in it is key. Each school has its own non-discussables. For one, it's the leadership of the principal. For another, the way decisions get made here. For all too many, it's race. So again, you know, it's just an uh, easy way to roll, to roll those out. I really like this last one from, um, or second to the last one from Dr. Singe. The health of a school is inversely proportional to the number of its non-discussables. The fewer the non-discussables, the healthier the school. The more the non-discussables, the more pathology in the school culture. And again, we know that quite often some of the non-discussables center around race. If we had more time, I would share an actual example that I had at a middle school where I used to work where the principal said to a group of teachers who wanted to get together of their own volition uh, to talk about race and racism and how it was impacting students, and the principal turned around and said, no, she was not comfortable with that process. Uh, and then lastly, all school cultures are incredibly resistant to change. So factoring in, trying to move forward with more explicit forms of, of equity work, you also have to be uh, aware of and prepare for uh, the saboteurs and those who might perhaps try and uh, even destroy some of the work. So also we now get to shift gears a bit to talk about, as you saw in the earlier picture that I showed, uh, our work is done in circle. It was not always done in circle, but we have been able to navigate ourselves and, and mature a bit to the point. So we're now we're started just by introducing terminology. Uh, res around restorative justice, and then in 2012-2013, uh, we developed a district-wide task force. We had about 19 meetings, and we took on the, the task or challenge of really just trying to overhaul uh, our discipline matrix to take it out of something that was pretty much a zero-tolerance matrix in disguise and put it in a, put it in a position where it had more alternatives uh, to, to suspension. 13-14 uh, school year, again, I was able to hire uh, Amani Dunham, 
restorative practice teacher on special assignment. Uh, she's one of the best uh, restorative practices facilitators and, and professional development gurus in the nation. So if you need support with restorative practices uh, on that level, you can seek me out and I can uh, connect you to her uh, as well. For the 14-15 school year, we also hired three uh, student support services social workers through LCAP, also with a heavy dose of responsibility around restorative practices in addition to uh, chronic absenteeism, foster youth, and our McKinney-Vento population. They also help our uh, schools set up their cost teams and all of that and their culture climate teams, but they, they have their hand deeply connected to uh, the restorative practices work. Uh, in 15-16, we were instrumental, again, through the work of, of Amani Dunham to set up uh, a lead teacher under restorative practices uh, that they were all provided a, a stipend to help deepen to help deepen the work. Also in 16-17, we were able, through a, 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 a honest uh, LCAP process, we were able to hire even a fourth social worker uh, to assist with RP, RP deepening. So January 9, 2014. This was our first restorative practices training district-wide. Uh, so Ms. Dunham and myself got all of the schools kind of primed and prepped. We gave them a pre, uh, brief professional development about what to be prepared for. But this was our very first uh, uh, formalized professional development around restorative practices. So each school brought about five, five people uh, on their team. and. Amani and I were both concerned initially about whether or not we would be able to keep the work intimate. And at one point during the second half of the day, there was not a dry eye um, in the house. And so again, we brought in restorative practices to help us deepen even our equity work. And I don't have time to tell you about the story of how we had to keep it uh, uh, separate just in, in the beginning, but then we were able to combine it organically. So. One of the other powerful testimonies about our equity work is that we've been able to maintain our work even with the change of superintendent. So when I came into the district, Dr. Dennis Bias was our uh, superintendent. Now our superintendent is Dr. Fred Brill. And so Dr. Fred Brill, our current superintendent, has helped us. He's been quite instrumental in helping us move this work forward as well in terms of our racialized equity work. So again, we, our, our superintendent took some bold action, and even the first year he was in the district, he actually facilitated uh, our racialized conversations and our equity work, and also brought in uh, the concepts connected to the work based upon symbols, beliefs, behaviors, and actions. Uh, each, each person had to develop a, prob a problem of practice, and then we went through a five whys exercise, uh, and it actually turned out to be just four whys. But what was unique about that process is as we organically went through a five whys process of centered around what is the biggest inhibitor to students receiving the type of instruction that they should receive, and what is the biggest inhibitor to our underserved students being successful. And we went through an organic process and at the end of that process, what was deemed by this particular team uh, of 50 people was racism. So now, no one had this came about. And at the end of this uh, webinar, you will also see some of the work of our former San Lorenzo High School principal last year, Ms. Toby Scruggs, and some of her radical work under the concept of symbols, where we had uh, this rebel guy, as you see there at the bottom, bottom right of your screen, that, that's, that's perceived to be and is connected to the Confederacy. So she walked the school through a process to get rid of that uh, racist 
mascot image from the campus. So you'll be able to look at that, uh, that YouTube uh, link about that work. So again, the work of equity and the strategic organic restorative practices connection, 2011-2012. Uh, so what happened when, we, when everyone came back from summer break, August of 2014? We all meet in the gym, the superintendent gives a speech, everybody gets together, all the teachers are back, principals are back, assistant principals, everyone. Uh, after that meeting, someone went to the superintendent, and it was actually Ms. Denise Landry, went to the superintendent and said, I'm, I'm concerned that we just had this Michael Brown killing, all of this stuff is happening in Ferguson, and there wasn't one mention of it during this day. That, that really touched the superintendent. So it caused him to do some radical work. He sent out a letter to all students and families and faculty members in our district talking about how important it is for us to engage. Again, we were already doing work, but he takes it to this next level and begins talking about the importance of, of engaging in this, in this anti-racist work and keeping stuff um, at the forefront. He may be one of the only superintendents in California that actually sent home a letter uh, connected to some of the tragedies that came out of Ferguson and some of the unrest that resulted of that particular tragedy. This is an image of students actually walking out, and you see at the very, very back there, uh, there's an image of our, our superintendent talking with, with the students. So what happened through this process was as we sat around, uh, the superintendent also said we need to have two community forums, one just internally for all district personnel, faculty, classified, uh, uh, directors, uh, teachers, whoever, but just internal within the district. Uh, and then he said we also want to have uh, a, a community-wide, a community-wide um, form as well. And so we, we decided we would do this, but what we weren't sure of is how we would actually facilitate the conversations. So just through an organic process, that's where it was determined that we would use our already embedded restorative practices circle methodology to have these conversations. So in that very moment, the, the marriage was made between our racialized equity work as well as our restorative practices work, and nobody had to stand up because I couldn't do it since I was already helping lead some of the equity work. I couldn't stand up and explicitly link the two. So now we had an organic moment where our racialized equity work and our restorative practices work was linked together. And so you see a picture here of our community. This is our internal district-wide um, district dialogue for understanding and change led by uh, the circle keeper who was Amani Dunham. And here is an image of our uh, community-wide dialogue. Now, some people said initially, oh, I will not participate in that because it's just going to be an opportunity to bash police. Well, we were able to disarm them of that particular rhetoric by helping them understand that the Alameda County Sheriff's Department not only helped us plan both days, but they also sat in the very midst of the fishbowl, right? But this, this was a pretty revolutionary, revolutionized moment for our district because, again, it, it connected our racialized equity work with the powerful component of restorative practices. And now, as I showed you in the beginning, we, we facilitate almost all of our racialized conversations in circle, using a talking piece, things of that nature. Um, so this is just some additional information to help you understand the conceptions of equity, and this was actually one of the slides used to kind of front load some of the work for uh, administrators and even teachers in our district to show the, the, the nuance of, nuances between restorative justice, which is the conflict resolution side of the work, and restorative practices, which is the community building side um, of the work. But this is part of our motif that, that we work from uh, throughout San Lorenzo Unified, keeping racialized conceptions uh, at the center of our work. So also just to, to, to look a bit deeper at, at some of this work from the spring 2014-15 to present, all racial equity leadership sessions facilitated by, by Amani Dunham and her team, they are done um, in circle. Now I'm just going to share with you also as we continue to blast forward here just the, the critical importance that we place on data and data sharing. So we've had Tableau in our district for, for 
uh, probably a couple of years, if not three years, but we've really kind of got it to a, a much more robust uh, perspective under some of the leadership of our former uh, Director of Assessment, Dr. Katerin Jurich, and now our current uh, Director of, of Assessment, Mr. Neil Block. Um, and so we, we use Tableau, which is also on our website. So it's been important for us to make sure we are sharing data, data in a very transparent way. So here's just some of our data. We have, we have a lot of work to do, but we, this is uh, some charts that I put together just pulling the, the numbers out of Tableau to make sure that our uh, school sites and our administrators could just have a bird's eye view of how we, were, how we did in terms of our CASP data. Now, we, we, we've grown in, in almost every area, but it still just shows you the work that we need to do in terms of who's meeting uh, and who's not meeting, but I'm just showing you the way that we are providing uh, the data. So this is the same data, but now under nearly met or exceeded. Uh, and, and then we're providing it also from a, a, a racial breakdown as well in terms of who's meeting, who's not meeting. And then we're asking for our, our administrators and even faculty to start looking at, at themes so we can start developing actions uh, to connect to the different themes that, that we see. So again, here's still the racialized data, nearly met uh, or exceeded in both ELA and math. And again, this is based upon our 15, 16 data. So I'm not really showing you the data to show you our, our growth or lack thereof, but to show you how important it is for us to put data uh, in front of our administrators and even teachers. So here's a, a, a glance. A, a glimpse or a glance at some of our suspension data only on the secondary level. So this only includes our high schools and middle schools. But again, it's a way to provide the data to our district so that they can not only see uh, the percentage of students on the campus, but also the percentage that represents uh, suspensions in terms of the data. So this is a chart that deals with suspension incidents. But again, it's deeply connected to our equity work because we want to try to present data in a way to where it's not easy to simply explain it away or blame it on a lack of resources or something like that. So just as an example, if you look at this top, top left um, box here, so for high school SLZ, it shows that African American students make up 15.7% of the district. 33% of the suspension incident. So yes, there are students that are counted multiple times, but just showing you that the number in white um, is the number of, of the student percentage on the campus, and the number in black is the suspension representation on the campus by that particular subgroup. So then we're just asking them to look for, look for themes, look for patterns, uh, and then to start having the conversations about action areas and action items as we just met yesterday, again, with additional data conversations with all of our um, assistant principals where we keep this information central as well. Here's just another look at how we provide the data. Uh, there's a gap here starting in 09 uh, when I started and then looking at year 13, 14, 15, and 16. It's another chart, similar data, but just in another, in another format. I know you can't really see this, but we also provide to them our chronic absenteeism data. This chart doesn't depict it, uh, but we also provide chronic absenteeism by race. And we did just sign on this school year with, um, with A2A, Attention to Attendance, to help us even deepen our work with chronic absenteeism. And we looked at some of that work even just yesterday with our uh, assistant principals. So again, TK Adult Equity Sessions to Racial Equity Leadership Sessions, now adding the certificated and classified um, staff to that. So it's important for us to not just have the conversations, but we want the conversations to lead to action. So like I just showed you the, the, some of the mascot work of the racist image that, that was at San Lorenzo High School, well, it was very important for our superintendent to make sure that we're not just having these bold, uh, racialized conversations, but that they're actually leading to action.
So that was one of the things we were able to point to last year in terms of some of the action that was taken out of these conversations to where we actually surveyed uh, the community, engaged in some bold uh, and courageous conversations. There were board presentations, people, you know, and not, and not everyone uh, was on board from a community perspective with the doing away with and of the racist mascot image. But again, we're talking about taking the work out of theory and putting it into action, and then we want to make sure that we're also embody in, that we're embodying and modeling the SLZ USD division. So here is our vision. We engaged in some work a couple of years ago, uh, maybe three years ago, to start the process of, of rebranding. Uh, so we created a new mission and we created a new vision, all, all under the conception of our racialized equity work from a district-wide perspective. This is a, a, a glance at our uh, renewed vision. Students will become creative, collaborative, compassionate, resilient, well-informed, and socially responsible advocates for equity and social justice as a result of their education, experience, and support from educators, families, and the community. So again, just going back here, if, this, if, if it is part of our vision that our students become socially responsible advocates for equity and social justice, then what that also means is that it is important for us as adults who work within the district to exemplify and model uh, what it looks like to be a socially responsible advocate for equity and, and social justice. So then we have to engage in uh, various exercises and discussions and action items that, that implicates and, and exemplifies our work as socially responsible advocates for equity and, and social justice. So we had a project uh, at the beginning of the year. My DICE program moved from one location uh, to another, and it was a pretty pretty stressful uh, time. The, lo the school had been, or the independent study program had been located in one place for almost 15 years, and, and now suddenly we were uh, relocating. So there was a lot of stress and anxiety um, around that. These are just some pictures of, of the DICE graduation. Um, and so what ended up happening, just to put our equity uh, vision and mission into play, the entire district leadership team, um, classified and certificated, all descended on the location of the new uh, DICE building and engaged in a process of helping all of those teachers get ready for the start of the new year. So it was a way of us uh, embracing the various uh, models and, and expectations that we have for a program that also has some of our most vulnerable uh, and underserved students in it. And just that act alone by the superintendent, uh, directors, and principals, and assistant principals, about 80 people descending on this particular program site to help the teachers get it prepared uh, is still a huge motivating factor in the minds of the teachers that helped us start off what seemed to be a difficult year, helped it start off as a very smooth uh, and positive year. So here are just some, some pictures um, of the program as, as they helped us get it all started. So these, these books were actually all, I think this was a total of 39 books. This was actually my project. I hauled all 34, 39 books and, and loaded them into uh, the library, which is actually, that's, that's classroom space as well. You can't see the other side. But what you're looking at is a picture of people all throughout the district office. This is one of the uh, directors out of business services actually shoveling to help get things prepared for this day. Here you have <laughs> uh, Barb DeBarger, our assistant superintendent of, of educational services. Behind her is our, our new coordinator of, of EL, uh, Mr. Robert Patrick, and hiding is our assistant principal at East Bay Arts and Royal Sunset, uh, Ms. Sharita Williams. 
But again, I'm not going to tell you everyone, share with you everyone's names, but what you're actually looking at is people um, hard at work, uh, engaging in this work to help teachers get their school site uh, prepared. There you have our superintendent over there in the corner with his hat. Uh, all of that, I was, I was part of the crew that shoveled all of that stuff to get it prepared so that plant could be put in place and things of that nature. There's our assistant superintendent of um, HR, and to the left is uh, one of our elementary assistant principals. So again, there's one of our teachers there smiling. That's Miss Sally Rubin. But again, this was a collaborative effort of us embodying uh, the vision of San Lorenzo Unified, again, having in mind the vulnerable population of students that attend this program. And if we're going to be equity-minded, then we have to actually engage in all of the, all of the aspects of the work. Our, one of our DICE teachers, Ms. Tracy Vernon to the right, uh, Ms. Connie to the left, also part of business services. And Mr. Ed Dialazzo all the way to the left, he's our director of uh, special services, our special education department. One of our principals of elementary school grant, Ms. Vanessa Bramlett. Dr. Kim Yarns to the left, principal of Bay Elementary, and James Gray to the right, principal of Arroyo High School. More pictures. So people got out of their comfort zone, put their work clothes on. There's our superintendent, Dr. Brill, uh, looking at some of the profile work that Ms. Sally Rubin was sharing with him about one of the incoming students. Neil Block, AKA plus one going off. So also, in this process, uh, the buzzwords that make up our, our mission, the fact that we are compassionate, collaborative, socially responsible advocates, resilient, uh, they then created a poster uh, that was then left with my DICE staff and team, and we are well informed, we are uh, creative, all of that was, was, was created for my DICE team, uh, then, and then DICE was able to turn around and, and return the favor and create posters for the district leadership team. Here's a picture of our September session, again, sitting in circle. Doesn't mean we're in circle the whole time. We then break out into smaller groups. Sometimes we're sitting, sometimes we're standing. But again, Ms. Amani Dunham and her team uh, inclusive of Jesse Dryden and, and Alex Harp, uh, do a great job, and I'm sure we'll have some exciting work. I think, I don't know, whatever the third Thursday is this month, but we have a lot to talk about now with our presidential election results and how that impacts. So, again, the racially charged conversations will continue, and, and the goal is for principals then and assistant principals to gain those skills engage in this actual process in real time, and take those learnings back to their site. Now, again, I said this before, one of the most difficult things is for our principals to then take these highly charged conversations back. It is still a scary reality and paradigm for a principal to stand before a faculty and staff and have racialized conversations. It's even more intense quite often if you're white and you have to have these conversations with a predominantly white faculty and staff. However, it goes back to what we talked about under the conceptions of some of Brene Brown's work. There is no such thing as an act of courage without engaging in a process of vulnerability. So we are, are always pushing our administrators uh, directors, even superintendent, teachers, everyone to be vulnerable with this work. We just had a fascinating, um, and it's in your packet, I think, the flyer, a fascinating professional development for all of elementary um, on Halloween. 
that was about racialized equity work under the, under the thematic conception of breaking silence. So there was a, a fishbowl on stage. I did the keynote. Uh, Mr. Barger did the opening. And then there was just a, a ton of uh, breakout sessions on courageous conversations, breaking silence, white allies, how to make sure your library is, is full of culturally relevant uh, literature. There were workshops on trauma-informed care, and that was for all of elementary. So every teacher, all the principals, the system principals, and again, that, that was able to take place because of all of the work that was already front-loaded over the previous nine years. There's no way in my first year, 0809, we could have had uh, such a radical um, equity professional development, and we're pushing for our professional development in March to be inclusive of equity lens uh, in a vulnerable and bold way. So again, these are just more, more images from our first session in September. There you have it. So that's San Lorenzo Unified in a nutshell based upon some of our conceptions in, in regards to how we systematically moved forward not allowing saboteurs and people to come in from the right or the left and shut down the work. There were attempts. There are always attempts, but we've been able to hold this work constant. We've been able to hold this work sacred, uh, and we've been able to keep this work protected so that it does not so that it does not go away. There's a lot of data norms that we need to improve on. We still need to improve our suspension rates. Um, we still need to improve some of our disproportionality. We're not on any statewide disproportionality list, but we still have African American students um, being the one group that's disproportionately represented by way of suspensions and, and referrals out of class. Even our, when we look at chronic absenteeism, our, our most chronically absent group of students are still our African American students. Um, so we're having those, those conversations, and, and we can never um, have enough of them. We're just trying to make sure as we're having the conversations, we're also including action items in those conversations. So I know I was supposed to go to 120 or 125. It's 123. So at this time, I will turn it back over um, to Jen, and she can facilitate us in terms of whatever kind of questions I may need to answer. But thank you so much for participating in this webinar, and hopefully uh, from a San Lorenzo Unified perspective, we've shared something uh, to help you be, uh, even if we just provided one nugget to help you be more effective with rolling out or deepening your, your equity work and your racialized equity work and the establishment of your equity teams. Um, we're appreciative of that, and hopefully it's beneficial. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Sahili, for being here with us today and sharing and being open uh, with what has worked, where you guys have struggled, and being open and sharing that with us. Uh, we do have a few questions that have already come, so if you have additional questions, feel free to add them into chat. Uh, but I did want to go ahead and go back to some of them we had in the beginning. Uh, one of them came in when you were talking about the themes of the first few years, and one of, it was, did you say that your special education teams are responsible for your SST and RTI squared work on site? No. So in actuality, we try to keep our SSTs as under a general education model. Um, so our counselors, assistant principals, there are times where our school psychologists will facilitate an SST, but when everything is functioning uh, appropriately, school, school counselors, uh, and assistant principals, maybe even our social workers will be responsible for facilitating SSTs, but the RTI squared work has been more of a uh, special education model. So RTI squared is one thing uh, where they're looking at the, the, the three tiers and, and all of that, but our SST model is a general education model. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much. Okay, let me look here real quick. Okay, uh, another question that came up was, do you have any suggestions for how to be explicit about racial justice advocacy in the face of some pushback about race, reverse racism? 
Yeah, I, I, I think it's important to figure out non-threatening ways to approach the conversation. So number one, you have to figure out what, what group you're going to start with. But I think, um, you know, the, the, the DVD that I mentioned, Mirrors of Privilege, Making Whiteness Visible, excellent. It's a non-threatening, and especially if, if the struggle is whiteness, you know, if the pushback is, is because of conceptions of whiteness and white supremacy, then I, I wholeheartedly recommend uh, Mirrors of Privilege, Making Whiteness Visible. I also am looking at a book entitled Uprooting uh, Racism by Paul Kibble. That's another great resource, uh, Uprooting Racism uh, by, by Paul, Paul Kibble, I believe is his name. And then there's also an, another book, and it, I guess it's a couple of years old. It's by Lei Mun Wa, and it, I think that the title is Let's Get Real. Uh, but if you look up the most recent work by, by Lei Mun Wa, uh, it's a collection of not even short essays, but it's a collection of paragraph statements from black people, white people, people of color in general, but it's all based upon each person answering questions. And it's some of those questions, uh, the way he phrases it, that most of the time we would not answer or we would not ask. So it's a non-threatening way of being able to say, okay, I'm not saying it, but let's read this narrative. Here's, here's someone in our society that's talking about how painful it is for them to talk about race. Or here's someone in our society that's white that's acknowledging that they struggle with their own forms of, of implicit bias or even explicit bias or, or, or things of that nature. So those, those are just a few sources that, that I would introduce, I also recommend on that same level Dr. Stephanie Graham. And I know she used to work in uh, LA Unify, and she's now retired, but I know she's still uh, doing a lot of her equity work. Hopefully that, that, that helps. Yeah, thank you for sharing all those great resources. Uh, okay, so next question. Uh, what exactly is racialized equity? So when, when we say racialized equity, we're talking about having the conversations about how students are, are being served instructionally, how students are being respond to, responded to from a disciplinary uh, perspective, and how we are, are building community across all of our campuses, making sure equity or, or that, that race is a deep part of the conversation. Because here's the reality. If we, if we have the EL conversation, that's a difficult conversation, but it's not as hard as the race conversation. If we have the, the, the socioeconomically disadvantaged conversation, that's a hard conversation, but it's not as difficult. We can have the poverty conversation, but it's not as, it's not as hard. We can even have the LGBTQ conversation, but it's not as hard. And even if we do have those conversations, when we start isolating those subgroups, if we put the group of students in poverty in a pot, if we put the LGBTQ students in a pot, if we put the uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged students or the EL students in a pot, at the end of the day, we still have racial gaps and racial problems within those dynamics. So racialized equity work in San Lorenzo Unified is our way of holding the race conversation constant and not slipping away and saying, okay, you know what? It's not about race, it's about poverty. It's not about race, it's about uh, zip code. It's not about race, it's about language um, acquisition. We know full well that after we control for all of those modalities, at the end of the day, we still have a race problem in our schools and throughout America. So our work is about trying to hold that constant. And, and RP, being an introductive element to that, helps us build a deeper form of community so that the conversations are a bit more palatable, not less powerful, but a bit more readily accepted. Well, thank you, Dr. Sahili. Uh, we are at 1.30. Uh, we do have another question in chat that we'll address, but I did want to go ahead and let people needed to go. We're going to go ahead and give the survey and also like the link to uh, the YouTube video that you discussed earlier uh, for people to see. Um, but this way we can go ahead and still address that last question. 
Uh, how is your district addressing the needs of underachieving students through the RTI squared or MTSS framework? So from an RTI squared um, perspective, what, what we are using is really just our instructional modalities. So it's nothing uh, actually explicit to SPED. It's still a, a, a district-wide uh, platform. But so like on the elementary level, we have a program that was implemented called SEALED. Um, we have uh, academic discourse on the second dev secondary level. Um, we have uh, an another literacy that just, just escaped me, um, another literacy program on, on the elementary level. And then we also have some deep work happening with our uh, next generation science standards as well. So we, we really are using on the secondary level a lot of our um, academic discourse language to really help uh, our students gain, whether they're EL or EO, to gain a better handle on being able to go deeper into the instructional milieu. All right, thank you so much. Again, thanks for being here today. Uh, you see that if you have any further questions, Dr. Sahili's email address is right there on the screen as well. Uh, I want to thank all of our particip participants as well for being here today and participating. Uh, you'll notice that we'll, the YouTube and the survey will open up. And if you need to contact us for any other reasons, uh, here is the contact information for here at, at State Performance Plan Technical Assistance Project. Thank you again, Dr. Sahili, for your time and everyone else for being here today. And balanced literacy was what I, I spaced out on. Balanced literacy is another one of our elementary programs being utilized to help students grasp instruction on a deeper level. Great. Great. What Thank a wonderful, you. thank you so much. <laughs> All right, thank you everybody for being here.